after their first visit. Call the army. They're here. Who? Who? Them? You thought they were destroyed. But they return. And they're getting bigger. After the second encounter. <laughs> you thought the fuzzy devils were dead. But you were wrong. You're not as smart as you think you are. The critters are back. <laughs> They've just rolled into the big city. Oh, safe at home. In search of new neighbors. <laughs> They're aliens. Aliens in the base. You have to believe her. They're big. They're huge. Footballs. <laughs> and they're never late for dinner. We don't have a gun up here or anything like that. <laughs> How about a meat cleaver? <laughs> what is eating him? Critters 3. You are what they eat. Open wide. Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Pod and the Pendulum, the horror movie podcast that covers every single horror movie franchise, one movie and one episode at a time, and now part of the Morbidly Beautiful Podcast Network. I am one of your hosts, Mike Snoonian, joined once again, as I am every week, by our my co-host, Jerry Smith. Jerry, how are we doing? I'm doing great. I've had a really great week, so I'm yeah, riding high on this one. Mm-hmm. That is yeah. super wonderful. And we are uh, joined once again by Nat Bremar. Nat, how are we tonight? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. Thank you so much for coming back, my friend, because you are, I would say, one of the foremost Critters experts. And along with that expertise, you bring a love for the movies that is unmatched by many, except for maybe Jerry. So Mm -hmm. I think it's an absolute pleasure to have you back on. Well, that and like I I think Nat's one of the few people, maybe the only person I'd ever want to see a TED talk on Critters from. You know? (laughs) So no no honestly like any episode that that Nat's on like the reception's always like really great so I mean it's it's always so cool so you you wouldn't want to have a um, TED talk from like Don Opper on Critters <laughs> <laughs> only if he's in character as Charlie well that would oh, be that amazing cool. hey I think it's appropriate that we're covering Critters three tonight because I believe this is the first movie that we've done that's actually been directed by a woman. Uh, this is directed yeah. by Christine Peterson. Um, and it happens to be what we're recording, uh, international women's day. Awesome. And as m- many pointed out, it's the shortest day of the year. Like we <laughs> absolutely like screwed women out of an hour of their day. <laughs> they like savings. So uh-huh. like once again, um, we're the worst. I'm not <laughs> also being like. Well, what's what's cool about uh, the director of this movie, Christ, uh, Christian, what, uh, Peterson, Christine I'm sorry, Peterson. Long Day. Uh, you know, her, while her body of work as far as a director might not be like the most memorable, I mean, Critters 3, you know, the aw- awesome body chemistry, uh, you know, Kickboxer mm-hmm. 5, mm-hmm. she was the second unit director or the second AD on so many like right. movies that I loved. I mean, Chopping I mean, Mall, you know, Bill and Ted, Night, uh, Tremors. You know? like, well, she, came, uh-huh. she came up through Zoetrope Pictures, which yeah. Francis Ford Coppola is, you know, which launched the careers of like Lucas and so many others. So, you know, she had a long and storied career, even if it wasn't necessarily – um, mm-hmm. Always as a director, like there's no denying the impact she had in a lot of films that we love. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, she was also like her career ties all the way back to the original Critters because she was the first AD of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, which was directed by Critters One director Stephen Herrick. Mm-hmm. Look at that, the circle of life. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that's that's what's great about the series. I mean, on every episode so far, we've talked about how it's kind of a familial thing, mm-hmm. you know. And like, even the not I hate to say the word use the word lesser because I I love these movies, you know, all of them. But uh, even the ones that are kind of not as you know well regarded as the first two, like you know three and four, it's mm-hmm. still very much a tight knit unit. I think. Mm-hmm. So I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's 
Absolutely. Uh, the other thing with Critters 3 is that uh, I think we're going to talk about this a lot tonight. Uh, it marks the feature film debut of none other than Leonardo DiCaprio, who went on to do nothing else in Hollywood ever again. Um, and it's kind of sad because he sowed so much promise here, but no idea what this dude's up to now. <laughs> His performance in this movie as the bratty uh, lead I mean, basically, his entire performance in this movie is that one scene in Romeo and Juliet where he's like screaming into the air, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, he's, he's <laughs> like, I, I love this movie, but DiCaprio's such a little brat from the first scene. Oh. On. Like, I know I love his character. I'm not even complaining, but like, I, I, I still, every time I watch it, I laugh at the first interaction he has with a little kid, you know? Mm-hmm. Because he's so like abrasive, like, it, it, like scolding this little kid. Like, it's, mm-hmm. it's great. I love it. Well, I just love that he wishes his stepfather dead, and then literally 15 <laughs> seconds later. My favorite, my favorite part of that we'll see is when he's pounding on the door, and he's like, come on, he can't help being an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> well, even like at the very beginning, you know, like that stepfather is a real piece of work, man. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, he, he like, do you know that scene in Terminator 2 where he's like, you know, John, listen to your mother. He's like, he's not my mom, Todd. Like yeah. that stepfather is every Todd, you know, yes. like, like it's like the writing. And we, ha- when talking about the writing, I mean, David J. Scow, I mean, one of my favorite writers yes. in the world. I mean, the kill riff is one of my favorite novels since childhood, which is weird. Like why were my parents? Let me read that. Why did mm-hmm. they let me read that? But like, you know, the writing in this movie is so dead on and it's, fun and it, it reminds me uh since you know staying on the path of doing weird comparisons the writing in this movie reminds me a lot of uh troll yes yeah. like it kind of has that mm. similar feeling you know and i i just love it it takes me back even watching it you know as a 39 year old man like it takes me back to being a kid and just like loving loving the setup of this movie it's so mm. so fun one thing about Leo's casting in this movie that is absolutely wild to me is that, uh, I mean, one, it kicked off an entire decade of all of these actors coming up through Hollywood, like Tobey Maguire and Joaquin Phoenix and Elijah Wood, all, you know, a decade's worth of losing roles to Leo DiCaprio. <laughs> but it started right here. And when I heard this, I, I thought it had to be a rumor because it didn't make any fucking sense. But... Uh, it is definitely true that Carrie was was up for this part and lost it to Leo. Wow. Wait, what? I don't get that. I, I and don't... that doesn't make sense for several reasons, because <laughs> the age difference by that point is huge. Are they sure that... Are they sure that Carrie Ells. Ells wasn't up for the role of the stepfather? Because that would make a lot more sense. Yeah, because I, I read, I, I like, I'd seen it and I'd seen it, and I was like, this has to be a rumor. And then, literally, on the commentary to Saw, Carrie talks about losing the part to Leo DiCaprio. <laughs> that just can't be right. There's no Can way. Can you that... imagine Carrie Elwes in those shorts and that shirt? You know, being bossed around by that stepdad as a girl with the goatee. With the goatee. <laughs> Princess Bride. <laughs> Oh my God! Princess Bride, he would be playing that fourteen-year-old kid. I don't. You know, That's fuck the Snyder cut. I want the alternate version of that with Carrie Elwes. Oh man, <laughs> I just don't. I I don't know. I think he might have been doing the same stuff that Craig T. Nelson was doing in the eighties, and maybe doesn't <laughs> quite remember those days with the um, kind of a clarity that one might need to get their facts right on something like that. Oh God, that is great. That just made my night. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel like this is how this episode's going to be. <laughs> I think so. I think, I think it's going to be a lot of, like the well, funny thing is like we had a lot of critters to quote unquote facts last episode. Oh my God. They were completely not, um, they were not grounded in any sort of reality. But like that one is a critter's factoid that is true at that point. That is just and insane. It no, so it here's, a, not. here's a question I had. So critters critters three is the first 
big screen appearance for DiCaprio, who's obviously he's an Academy Award winner. He's gone on, you know, to work with Tarantino, with Scorsese, in many films with Scorsese. Um, he's been with the camera, like he's had a undeniably an icon, absolute icon. Um, one of many kind of young men and women that got their start in these like B movie pictures and then went on to have these phenomenal careers. Like I think of like Johnny Depp in a nightmare at Elm street oh, and he, uh, Brad Pitt in um, the Freddy's nightmares television show. And is it student bodies as well? The one with Brad Pitt. I'm trying to think what like low budget slasher. Uh, was it that or is it cutting so, class? It's cutting, cutting class. Okay, it's cutting class. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Knew it was like a school related title. Kevin Bacon isn't quite a perfect fit, but you know, obviously he's very well known for Friday the thirteenth. Like who what other big name stars can we think of that got their kind of start in these, you know, B movie pictures or well, even I mean the burning. I mean the burning has like what Jason Holly Alexander. Hunter, Jason yeah, Alexander. Uh, Fisher Stevens, mm-hmm. who obviously isn't like a list, you know, like Brad Pitt level, but I mean, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. Uh, I mean, Clooney, uh, Clooney's definitely one for Return of the Killer Tomatoes and uh, Return to Horror High. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Nicholson got his start in Corman Pictures, if I yep. remember correctly, as well. So. You know, it's just incredible to me how many A-listers kind of got their start in these in these genre pictures, and you never know. Like, you know, it's funny. Uh, speaking on Jack Nicholson and the Corman movies, when I was like sixteen, uh, there was a store in my my hometown called Montgomery Wards. It's like this mm-hmm. huge kind of like it had everything in it, and we went in the video section of that electronics, and they had this Jack Nicholson box set, and I was like a you know film nerd early on, you know like kind of like my nose in the air, mm-hmm. and I wanted to buy this Jack Nicholson box set because it's like movies I hadn't watched or heard of, you know. So I, like my my dad spent like twenty twenty five bucks on the box set. I got it home, and it was just like the Corman movies that he was in for maybe like a like a second. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. You know, like like Little Shop of Horrors or something like that. Excellent. Like, I, I, it was funny because I was just like, what the hell? I just spent money on this? But as an <laughs> adult, you know, those are some of my favorite movies. So. Right. Yeah. So what is the backdrop of this movie? Over, It's the first Critters to go direct to video, which yep. – Back then, I don't think would have been. I think like later in the decade, direct to video definitely had a certain stigma to it. I mean, the first Critters is a bit of a minor hit. It does about five or six times its budget. The second Critters, although I kind of prefer that movie slightly overall, mm-hmm. um, it basically breaks even at best. Um, probably goes on to lo- actually lose money until you factor in home video sales and. Critters 3 seems like kind of like the quintessential straight to video early 90s kind of my uh, horror movie. Yeah, this was I, I thought a lot about that. I think I, I wrote some notes down about that. But yeah, this is 1991 was basically like the meteoric rise for straight to video. Yeah, like this was post the, the, the absolute boom of full moon. And it did, you know, it's structured like a lot of straight-to-video movies. It's much more uh, centered on a single location. Um, And it did what a ton of straight-to-video movies did at the time as well by the fact that Critters 3 and 4 were shot Mm back-to-back. Wasn't was 4 actually done? uh, Did they complete 3 first? uh, I think they shot them, like... At the same time. Okay, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, and I think that that was really big uh, in the area. That that was the same time that, like, Transfers 4 and 5 were shot at the same time. Yeah. So Species 2 and 3, Puppet Master 4 and 5 were all shot at the same time. And So that was a big, like, cost-cutting maneuver uh, in mm-hmm. the early 90s for straight-to-video stuff. And that was, like, such a fun time, too. I, like, I remember going to the video stores and you would see all these sequels to these bigger movies that you went to the theater to see, you know, that you didn't know that existed. I mean, I, I loved Relentless. But, you know, going to the video store, I could find Relentless 2 and 3 and be like, what the hell? You yeah. know, or like, you know, you get Critters 3 and 4. Uh, you know, later on, we got like the second and third Darkman movies. 
yeah. you know, it was such a fun time for home video, I think, right. because because like as a teenager, you don't really have that kind of uptight like film snob thing that a lot of older people get that kind of look down on those movies. If you yeah. saw a continuation of a movie that you liked, you didn't give a shit if it was straight to video. Like that was kind of like our mecca in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When- I remember I would see, and I'm not the biggest full moon, uh, like the biggest like full moon enthusiast overall. But there was a series of movies in the mid to late '90s, like the subspecies yeah. vampire movies, which I think are among kind of my favorite vampire movies of all time. They were mm-hmm. kind of shot on location in Romania amongst these old uh, old ruins uh, and amongst a lot of the small villages, which added a really cool creepy atmosphere you oh, yeah. had radu which you know terrifying looking vampire these movies are bloody and gory and just super fun yeah and they look oh. just like they look so much more expensive than they are just based on the mm-hmm. locations absolutely mm-hmm. Can't wait for you guys to get to that franchise oh dude me I, too i think yeah. the only thing holding me back from doing it sooner than later is there's really no streaming options for them and there's not an affordable dvd or blu-ray set that i can find and maybe i'm just not looking in the right place oh, no. yeah subspecies are all on uh blu-ray i know through full moon i believe yeah yeah so they're, they're yeah uh, they also I'll, have uh, the full moon uh I don't know if they still have it, but isn't the Full Moon have that streaming? Yeah, thing? Full Moon has a streaming channel through Amazon. That definitely has oh, a little bit of that. And yeah, all right. Then so, I'll and also, uh, speaking on subspecies, really quick, there is a there is such a good conversation, like an interview with Ted Nicklau, the director of those, mm-hmm. uh, a, a few issues back in Scream Magazine from Justin Beam. It is such a good chat about subspecies. It's also amazing we're even bringing up subspecies just at random because, you know, one of the only movies I can think of outside of subspecies that stars the actor that played Radu is Critters 4. Mm. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See, this is why I love having Nat on the show. <laughs> so, uh, you got out. some... You got some on as hove to to look forward to next time. So, yes. so Jerry, you mentioned uh, David. If I say David Shaw, am I saying that correctly, or is it Scow? Those are I two was, different authors. Hmm? I I've always pronounced it David J. Scow, but I mean, I, I you know I'm, yeah. I pronounce things wrong. So S- right. Well, so basically, David J. S. C. H. O. W. and mm-hmm. David J. S. K. A. L. Yes, different authors. Yeah, they're they're right. very different. Yeah, right. But I'm thinking David um, Scow. He's a splatterpunk author, author with yes. like a mm. bunch of novels. He's also responsible for some of the early drafts of Freddy vs. Jason, mm. um, and mm. I believe the Crow, the Crow yeah. um, storied career in horror and splatterpunk. Um, one of maybe one of the guys responsible for developing Dominic Necros, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. um, with yes. his script. Um, but you know, and a lo- lifelong horror fan. Um, how how did he get involved with Critters Three? Was he involved in the first two movies in any way? Like I couldn't find anything. He he was that. not involved with the first two, but this I, I'm pretty sure it was just because this was. Um, right off the heels of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, which he also mm-hmm. yep. uh, at New Line. And mm-hmm. I think it was probably kind of an in-company thing. Mm-hmm. Well, he had a, yeah, he had a history with New Line. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, like, like Nat said, Texas Chainsaw 3. Uh, he also wrote an episode of Freddy's Nightmares, which, I mean, mm-hmm. is one of the, like, I love that episode so much. Yeah. Uh, it's hilarious. Uh, you know, he, he worked on The Dream Child, mm-hmm. you know, like, so he has, he had, you know, a good... Uh, passed with them and even later on i mean he went on to write texas chainsaw the beginning you know mm-hmm. uh, he was involved in the new creep show that's on shutter oh totally i mean mm-hmm. even non-genre uh you know i he wrote an episode of, of the criminally underwatched mom city which i thought was just so good uh no he's such a great such a great writer and like his novels like I said, were like so so huge to me as a kid, mm-hmm. which I mean, they're nothing that a kid should be reading. But <laughs> right. Like, 
I, I would highly recommend readers, if you could find a copy, read his novel, The Kill Riff. It is so, mm-hmm. so good. Uh, but, yeah. no, like, he has such a unique voice, you know? Like, he's able to tackle all these different kinds of films, but they, all of them just, at least to me, feel like completely his kind of writing. You watch The Crow, you know, you watch a movie that could, it, thematically it couldn't be any different, you know, Texas Chainsaw 3. But for some reason, there is that kind of similar writing style, I think, you know, like dialogue and that kind of stuff. And I think it really shows in Critters 3 and, you know, Critters 4 as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's definitely something to touch on too because he was, like we said, right at the forefront of that, like, uh, Skip Inspector and Joe Lansdale and Richard Lehman era of mm-hmm. Splatterpunk. And yet... Critters 3 is, I would say, the tamest Critters movie, like, by far. This mm. is, as a kid yeah. who thought, who, whose parents kind of tricked, like, kind of tricked my parents into thinking these were kids' movies, Critters 3 is the most bordering on actually being a kids' movie. Right. It feels like a 90s kids' movie. It has very much those kind of family overtones mm-hmm. uh, and everything, and I, I think that's a really interesting juxtaposition that he he knows how to really go for gore, and it was really, you know, almost lighthearted with this one. Right. Well, of the three movies, it's like the first of the three that has a real kind of message to it overall. Like it's very. I mean, you're looking at like gentry, you're looking at these residents being kicked out of their apartments because you know you have an evil landlord that is doing everything in his power to boot them so he can turn it into like a shopping mall a new district uh, like a new mm-hmm. shopping area you have like the dad in the movie who basically has to leave his two kids behind in order to like go you know conduct trains and like because they're so there's just no other way for him to make any money because there are no jobs although it did take me a while i wasn't sure if he was going on trains because he was a conductor or if he was just a hobo that was just gonna like <laughs> pack his satchel and like hop trains and oh try it like it wasn't clear for a little bit and oh. i think there definitely needs to be more like hobo horror movies. Yeah. I really hobo do. horror. Wow. But yeah, this is definitely at the forefront of the conversation about like apartment horror. This is like the way we talk about the so openly talk about shitty landlords now. Like this movie was right at the forefront of that conversation. Well, you you not only get DiCaprio's asshole stepfather, but you get the character of Frank. Right. Which is so hilarious for me to watch because it he's that typical nineties like you know what I mean? Like you so don't bad. know you don't know if he's from like New York or like what you know what I mean? Like that stupid accent he has. But what's funny for me, he looks almost identical to Scott Derrickson. So <laughs> it's it's every time I watch Critters Three, I start laughing because it feels like Scott Derrickson is playing like this kind of like I don't know, post punk slum lord like management guy i absolutely want like a movie about the making of dr strange was just (laughs) this actor and it's just every every time they call cut he's just going oh 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 oh." (laughs) it's the same guy no (laughs) to me he looked a lot like schneider the scuzzy maintenance guy from the old one day at a time oh, sitcom yeah, from the seventies and early eighties. Like I just kept seeing him as Schneider and he had the same kind of role and that same kind of grossness to him overall. Like that's who, so I didn't know Derrickson looked like Schneider from <laughs> one day at a time. Well, I mean, you know, probably not, but like, oh man. And, and he also played the, the asshole that punched Jenny in uh, Forrest Gump and mm-hmm. Forrest Gump beats the shit out of him, you know? But, yep. uh, but uh, I, that's what I love about this movie. And I love about, I love this about every Critters film. It's, it's, there's so many great characters in it. Like this one has, I mean, they're a little more like dramatic. I mean, you know, as as slummy as Frank is, like he's the one character in the movie that I think is like it's harder to believe that it's a real person, even more than the Kreitz. Yes, you know what I mean. Like, yes. like I think Frank is is more like out of this world than the Kreitz. Like, it's such an overplayed 
performance that it, you can't help but just laugh and feel like just joy watching it, you know? The the hand puppets absolutely give a more nuanced performance. <laughs> Frank. <laughs> Frank is like so over the top and it's such a nineties kind of over the top that he literally feels like like he could have just walked out of an episode of Adventures of Pete and Pete. Like Or or like Blank Check or something, you know? Yeah. Like <sighs> Yeah, there's so much. Everything is really exaggerated in this movie in such a 90s straight to video ways. Like, Frank is the absolute most. And then, like, a few notches below Frank, you have Rosie. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Rosie, who absolutely is like fawning over Charlie, like, every moment that As she's he's on screen. But she is like within. Ten seconds of lighting eyes, she's like, "Who is this cool drink of water right in front of me here?" And my favorite part of the goddamn movie is that to this one person, this dude is an old school cowboy. This mm-hmm. is fucking shame. He's just riding in on it's saving the day, and he's just gone without a trace. And she's just like, "My God!" She gets the literal vapors at one point. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Well, what's uh, like funny is like Charlie. Even Charlie is, I think, a little more heightened in this movie than he usually is. I mean, he's kind of like right from the beginning when he pops up, you know, in the woods. Like it, it almost feels like he's been wandering around after Critters Two, you know, the whole time until this scene. You know, like it, mm-hmm. it, it, it looks like he's still wearing the parachute. You know. Yes. <laughs> That's, yeah, I love, I I really love what they do with Charlie here so much because it feels like if we didn't see the first two movies, this guy would just be Crazy Ralph. <laughs> but we have the background knowledge to know that, you know, he's right. And it's also like, when you go the overall hero's journey for Charlie of uh, <laughs> Critters 1 through 4, this is definitely that kind of dip where he was on the rise and he was finding purpose. And then, you know, you get that rise and that, and that finally kind of concrete fulfilled purpose in Critters 4. And this is that period where you kind of, you kind of fall down a few notches. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of makes sense though, when you look at the arc, because at the end of Critters 2, and again, I'm probably reading a little bit too much into this, but the end of Critters 2, like Charlie has his heroic moment where he saves the day after struggling to fit in as one of the bounty hunters give just, just given his natural limitations. Um, so, if, but the, he, he has his heroic moment. He saves a day, he saves the town, but then that's taken away from him. Like yeah. Ugg gets back on the, the ship and he's like, okay, we're, you know, we're out. Um, you know, Brad leaves town, the sheriff leaves town and sure, like he gives, he gives Charlie the sheriff badge and, you know, they drive off the night and, and it's a feel good moment. Um, it wouldn't, you know, if this was done nowadays, there would be like a comic book in between Critters 2 and 3 explaining how the town folk said, uh, we're not just going to like let the old sheriff hand off the badge to the first person he lays eyes on and you can see how Charlie is, is very quickly voted out of office. Cause yes, that's not legal. He doesn't have any formal (laughs) training as an officer of the law, uh, which reminds me, um, at the school I work at, like there was a student who's struggling and just doesn't care at all. And, and we're like, what do you want to do one day? He's like, I want to be a cop. And I'm like, well, dude, you need to know how to read. I mean, that's literally part of your job. You have to read people their rights. I'm like, this isn't going to cut it right now. Uh, I should have said that. But, um, <laughs> Sorry. So you could easily see a moment in, you know, like now Charlie's like left to kind of wander. Like he doesn't have a purpose. Like obviously, for some reason, whatever reason, the sheriff gig didn't work out. He has no way of re- – he, he's cut off from Ugg at this point. So what else is he to do? Yeah, another thing that I think is a big kind of background detail of this movie uh, is just the way – it's, I think, directly tied probably into what's going on with Charlie is the way people talk about Grover's Bend. You mm. can kind of tell that Grover's Bend is kind of toast. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, dead now. 
Uh, which makes sense when the this time the entire town saw aliens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's not like one family or, you know, Brad. Like, yeah. You know, it's not the boy that cried wolf. It's the town that cried wolf mm-hmm. at, this t- at this point, you know? Like, I, I can't imagine. I, what I can see is probably a higher up got wind of the whole town saying that little aliens were eating everyone. And they probably just, like, cleaned house, you know? And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think all of us are reading too much into Critters 3. But at the same time, I mean, you know, this is what we do. <laughs> and see, you know, that again, definitely would be that definitely would be a comic that bridged the two movies, like the government assassination and rounding up of like <laughs> interning all the villagers of Grover's Bend into camps and exterminating them. And you just see like it ends with like <laughs> Brad's, Brad's mm-hmm. corpse just like tossed on the trash heap. <laughs> uh, and, like, Sal- yeah. Sally joining the wrong team. We say we're reading too into this, but then, you know, again, it's like we point out, Mick Garris and David Chow are, are no joke, you know, writers. Of course. Yeah. So. I mean, there is that continuity between, and I do appreciate they reference Grover's Bend. You have them, you have people referencing, oh yeah, there's this town they said. So rather than having, you know, the Krites be disregarded as a threat right away, it's, you know, they're given some credence, which I kind of like. And another thing I think is really neat is that you always, you know, by the time you do the third entry, you do the uh, the recap of the first two movies flashback. Mm-hmm. But it's neat in Critters 3 because, you know, you get the major plot points, but the the flashbacks you get to 1 and 2 are really focused on Charlie's arc specifically. Yeah. Which you mm-hmm. rarely see. And those kinds of like quick edit, you know, mm-hmm. give me the big beats of the first two movies kind of flashbacks. And I, I really, I really like that. Well, I think that speaks a lot on Critters 3. You know, yeah, it, it came out during that time, you know, the direct video era and especially the direct video sequel era. But what I've always loved about Critters 3 is it, it definitely feels like a step up from a lot of the other movies that were doing the same thing. There's this mm-hmm. care involved in Critters 3, whether it's David Child's writing, you know, Christine Peterson's directing. Like, it's a fun movie, and I think it respects what came before it very much. Mm-hmm. And I, I also think there's this, like, playful... There's there's just such a playful vibe to it, and I think that's a lot... That's definitely in the writing. I mean, Josh accidentally basically trapping his stepfather <laughs> with the Krites. You know, it, it's like... As a kid, anyone that is pissed at their dad or especially stepdad, you know, like mm-hmm. that's something like out of our like wet dreams, you know what <laughs> I mean? <laughs> like that or like just the whole setup of the movie. Like it's so just cheery and playful that like, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it's a feel good sequel. It's a feel good yeah. movie. And we don't get those very often anymore, you know, and mm-hmm. if we do, they're looked down on. Yeah, you know, like like this For is sure. a perfect example, a perfect example of a fun, carefree, innocent sequel in the horror genre. You know, I love it. I mean, it yeah. kind of has a Goonies set up and feel to it overall. You have this group of people that are get booted out of their home by the evil landlord overall, and they kind of all band together to take one more crack at it before they lose lose their housing. Well, I yep. mean, it's it's a really good sequel to The Super with Joe Pesci, I think. I've <laughs> never seen that. Oh, don't. I'm just joking. <laughs> but, yeah, another thing is, like, uh, especially, like, it's a lot lighter, like we said, and especially, like, with a lot of the Krite stuff, it almost feels more cartoonish. Yeah. Uh, and another thing, you know, I think it was, like, this coming out in, like, 1991 you know, last time I was on with Critters 1, there was a lot of talk about the kind of Gremlins-Critters comparison and how Critters wasn't uh-huh. really inspired by Gremlins. But I think Critters 3 was definitely inspired by Gremlins 2. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's the, no way it, it's not. You get things like you didn't get before. Like you get some more kind of individualized Critters this time. You got the critter with like the scarred face. You got the critter who farts chili. You got the critter who you know spews bubbles. <laughs> and you know, like especially things like the 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 out of nowhere bowling for critters sequence. 
yes. feels like it could be directly lifted, like right out of Gremlins too, where you get mm-hmm. the commentator, you get for for no reason, you get like like you don't even superimpose it with like someone else watching bowling. It's just you know we're throwing a cry and uh, we're getting that kind of that kind of commentary right well you get those moments like those comedic moments where like frank doesn't know there's a critter behind him in the vent and he just thinks it's an animal and he starts yelling at (laughs) at the instead of getting like immediately attacked like the critter's like okay i guess i'll just kind of hang out here that kind of (laughs) comedic mistaken identity which i think is always kind of a cute little moment you have like your i'm trying to think of the, the character's name but the the badass woman in this movie who like repels herself down to make a phone call i oh want to say it's marge but I, why am i arsha drawing? i want to talk about that please so do badly. because i wish i was confident as confident about any joke i had ever made as they were as confident about upside down Marsha trying to reach that phone, mm-hmm. which they spent <laughs> nearly a third of the fucking movie yeah. on. <laughs> that joke goes on forever. That is commitment to a gag. Man. What's amazing about it too is there's no real payoff for it. Like you think that she's going to get at some point, like the critters are going to be wise to like what's going on. Nope. And they're either going to like chew through the rope or they're going to appear from like underneath her and like eat her alive on there or, but Nope, she's just going to hang there by one leg on a rope. <laughs> and so she we can move, swing over to ah, the pavement. <laughs> we move on to the next story beat of Charlie coming in to save the day. And they have to have the awkward interaction with her still hanging there to be like, Oh, Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Can you imagine that being pitched in like 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 production meetings? You know, like it's it's almost like I feel like like uh, David maybe had that as a joke, and people like ran with it, like yeah. And he was like, wait, what? <laughs> like I don't know. It's an apartment building. Yeah, I don't know. We I get like the feeling we don't going to wanna... be like test footage, and they just yeah. added it in to bulk up the runtime. We yeah. don't want to like repel the landlord market, like, uh, and a woman is upside down trying to reach a payphone for half the movie, like <laughs> fucking salt. Right. The only thing that would have made that joke better is when she finally gets there. If she drops her dime to like and is unable to make a phone call, <laughs> like she finally succeeds in getting over, and like, or it, she goes and like the dime falls out and she can't make the call. The best thing. That could have possibly been the payoff for us to spend a, a goddamn half hour on reaching that phone. The only payoff I would have accepted is she gets there, someone else barges in in front of her. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the mom from Kevin. Home Alone. It's Kevin's mom from Home Alone. Who's <laughs> like, Literally, the T Rex of Kevin the T Rex is barges in the payphone oh. and forces her out. You know what's funny is uh, while we were talking about the whole Carrie Elwes thing, I was looking it up on IMDb for like the shitty trivia, mm-hmm. and it had to be a Carrie Elwes fan that wrote this. But it says Carrie Elwes turned down the role of Josh. <laughs> That's not true. No, no, I no, I I don't agree with it whatsoever. <laughs> but you can totally tell. Thing. You can totally tell it was somebody that was like, no, I, I you know, the head of Carrie Elwes fan club. Yeah, I love like, that. Just a trivia note: Bill, Billy Zane previously appeared in Critters. <laughs> just like it's not about you know, it's just, we're not talking. You know, there's so little to talk about that we're going to yeah. just talk about other movies. <laughs> well, uh, when we're talking about the cast of this movie, one of the the titans of this movie that needs to be pointed out is Francis Bay as Mrs. Menchie's. Oh, definitely. Francis Bay is a goddamn icon. From oh, dude, she's, she's a legend. To David mm-hmm. Lynch, to the grandma and Happy Gilmore. Exactly. And, like, this woman did not start acting. She did not make her screen debut until she was 59. Jesus. See, that gives and me she, hope. And she racked up 171 credits. My God. What did she do before acting? I have no idea. Uh, like, she really? she was on the crew for Poltergeist. No, I'm just kidding. 
Stop it. She directed Poltergeist. She directed Poltergeist. <laughs> she, did, uh, she ghost directed Poltergeist 2. <laughs> this is she... Mindy. Francis Bay was actually the tequila worm in Poltergeist 2. Uh... Many people don't know that. <laughs> I am, oh my god! Let's look at early life and career at this point. Do, 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 do. No, like I, I'm, I'm actually like a huge fan of her work. I mean, I'm, I'm a massive David Lynch fan. So I mean, you know, she played, you know, Mrs. Tremond in in Twin Peaks. You know, The Fire Walk with Me. Uh, you know, Aunt Barbara in in Blue Velvet. I mean, she has Ooh. such a big filmography, uh, and I, she's, she was one of those like character actors that you would just. You'd see in a movie, you know, and like, you know, you, like you you remember her from every single movie you watch, you know, like she, she's great in this one. She's the woman that Jerry Seinfeld steals the ro- ro- loaf of rye bread, marble mm-hmm. rye from in that famous episode where he like robs an old woman for her last loaf, the last loaf of bread for a dinner party. Mm-hmm. And as a as a full moon fan, she's also she has a great role. Uh, Great performance in Stuart mm-hmm. Gordon's Pit and the Pendulum. Yeah. Yeah. That was like right around the time uh, of this movie, right? This is like the exact same time. Uh, yeah. No, she's great. And another thing I really like about Critters uh, 3 compared to a lot of uh, other movies of the type, especially genre stuff, is when you have young uh, kind of centered around young protagonists like that, like this, like 14, mm-hmm. like 12 to 14 year old protagonists. It's almost always about kind of getting over self-absorption and about learning responsibility. And what I love is that we have the inverse of that with Critters 3, where mm. we are coming into this movie with kids who already feel responsible for their parents. Right. Like, yeah. Josh is trying his best to be his dad's conscience. Mm-hmm. His stepdad's conscience is just not going anywhere. And then, you know, Annie is literally responsible for her dad. Annie is literally being the parent. In right. the because her dad's just like, bring me the battery operated TV. Yeah. Yeah, the dad is the so actors... dismissive. Oh, in general. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Totally. Do you think the actor that played Johnny really got tired of playing roles with above kids that had shitty dads? Because <laughs> remember, like he was he was the kid he was the main kid in Kindergarten Cop, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just like at some point this kid's like, guys, like I really love my dad. Like these what characters. If he didn't, suck. Though, what if what if he didn't? And what if he was just he's like, like living by carrying through his characters, right? If he's like, this is cheaper, I actually get paid for it as opposed to paying for therapy, you know, and I get like, so it's quite possible that was the case. Yeah, I'm I'm paying for my college with Fuck You Dad movies. (laughs) I think that's all of our goals, you know. (laughs) Anytime I write something, you know, I'll email my dad, fuck you. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, no, like the the movie, like we're saying, uh, you know. When I talk about Critters 3, I, I, I find myself, unfortunately, saying, you know, obviously it's not as good as the first two, but, you know, it, it's a lot of fun. And the more I think about it and the more I watch it, I mean, I watched it again this week, like, it's kind of unfair to even hold it to that standard, you know, because, like, I feel like, like our friend Justin Beam says, you know, every movie should exist on its own, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, you don't judge a movie based on something else. And I think Critters 3, if... People could kind of look past the stigma that goes with directed video stuff because mm-hmm. it is just that. It's just a stigma. I mean, some of my favorite movies are directed video movies. Like, Critters 3 is just, I think, a solid family horror film in general. You know, not even just as a sequel, but just even as a standalone film. I mean, yeah. like I said earlier, the, the kind of vibe of Troll or, you know, like any other like horror films in a building. You know, or even like Nat said, Gremlins 2. There's that playful, fun family horror subgenre that maybe we don't talk about enough as horror fans, you know, because I think maybe some people kind of look down on them. But I think they're just as important as, you know, some of the heavy hitters or like the, the dramatic ones, you know, or the, the scarier ones. I think Critters 3 is, is in a lot of ways, a, even a better gateway horror film maybe than the first two films in some ways 
Mm-hmm. It, it, well, it returns yeah. to that vibe of the first movie with a very low body count, very little blood, very little gore overall. So yeah. you and, absolutely could have a lot of fun with this with, I think, seven and up would be fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, um, like again, like the original movie, more focused on a single family. Yeah. So it does feel like a return to the original in that regard, too. I also yeah. think that it's, it's a really, it was a really good idea to take the setting out of Grover Fence. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that any franchise, at a certain point, they should toy with the formula. Mm-hmm. You know, it works for some movies. It doesn't work for other franchises. But, I mean, there's always that movie in a series where they're like, you know what? Let's try to do something different. And when it works, it works, kind of like Critters 3. And, yeah. you know, when it doesn't, you know, Jason's a worm. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I am <laughs> not going to put up they did with not even a that. little bit. <laughs> They would not even take that film out of Crystal Lake, Jerry. Oh. Look, look, my friend, Jason Goes to Hell is so much better than you give it credit for. I mean, it's it's easily ahead of parts eight for sure. It's much better than Jason Takes Manhattan. Well, I mean, it's we, definitely not Freddy flying on a broom, you know? I, I <laughs> okay. actually really enjoy... I actually really enjoy Freddy's Dead. I, I, I more, am losing this more, one. more so than I would. I'm going gonna, gonna to drop something terrible right now. Oh no! I like Freddy's Dead more than a new nightmare. I know your your dislove of new nightmare is pretty well documented, though. I, and and I know like there's I have a screw loose when it comes to that. I I don't know what it is. I just cannot connect with that movie. I think Freddy's Dead is a lot of fun. What's funny is I really associate Freddy's Dead with this movie because I was a big Freddy mm-hmm. fan. Uh-huh. And I, you know, I didn't have a ton of access to the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. So like as a kid, I really only saw the first three and mm-hmm. New Nightmare and definitely not all the time. So Critters 3, I owned like I said last time I owned this movie on VHS and the trailer uh, for Freddy's Dead was right at the front of this movie. <laughs> and I would sometimes watch Critters 3 just because I was in the mood to watch the Freddy's Dead trailer. That's incredible. <laughs> that is awesome. Do you guys remember the trailer for New Nightmare? Not the theatrical one, but the one that was on the VHS of Man's Best Friend. Where the whole trailer, you don't know it's a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. It just yeah. kind of seems like it's all about just sleep deprivation. At the very end, it goes black, and then Freddy does that pop-up thing. Yes. Like, I, that was one of the biggest moments of my entire life. You know, renting Man's Best Friend the day it came out from my video store. And seeing that trailer for New Nightmare and thinking, like, what the fuck? We're getting more Freddy. Mm-hmm. You know? Like, it, it's so huge. So, yeah, I have never seen that. I'm going to have to seek that out. Yeah, I love trailers like that in general. Like, as much as I don't love the movie, the trailer for uh, Resident Evil Apocalypse, I think. The yeah. Second movie, that whole trailer was like a skin cream ad or whatever. Yeah. And then they just say something like, in the pursuit of perfection, accidents happen, and the skin starts decaying and turns into a zombie. And then it just yeah. brings up the title, and that's the whole trailer. And it was perfection. Excellent. Wow. Um, I love those. Now, when we talked about the first Critters movie, you talked about how it felt very much like a siege movie. And I think that carries over very much so in, in Critters 3. It's very much yeah. like a, a hunker down. It actually, like, it reminds me of a kid-friendly version of that movie Mulberry Street. Um, <laughs> done by Jim Mickle, right? Uh, Mickle, who went on to do Stakeland, but it, or it just reminded me of that. Or not... Stakeland. He did. Um, no, he yeah, he did Stakeland. He did. You're right. And, and then we uh, are what we are. And right. You know, it's actually the star and writer of it, Nick Demichi. Demichi. I think. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You know, kind of like I know Mulberry Street, if I remember correctly, is mostly like a rat infestation. Yeah. Um, so this kind of felt like a kid friendly version of that of that movie. Yeah, you know, I I gotta see him to eradicate him. <laughs> <laughs> well you guys know speaking of siege movies the original title of this movie was assault and precinct critters three right stop <laughs> stop. 
Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like honestly, like I think thematically, uh, you know, the the siege aspects of the first film, I, I think, you know, it went kind of bigger for the second movie and I really love the fact that they did dial it back for this one it is very I think Critters 3 is is a lot closer to the first Mm -hmm. Critters than Critters 2 was Mm -hmm. and you know it spends time even if they're really overacted and over the top like Frank Critters 3 does spend a lot of time kind of developing each character Mm -hmm. kind of being their own personality you know kind of like a film like Basket Case you know, mm-hmm. the, the couple the couple characters that you see in that motel are very fleshed out in Basket Case. Yes. And for some weird reason, like it's a weird comparison, but I've always kind of put Critters 3 and Basket Case together growing up. Like those Ooh. movies, for some reason, they just always reminded me of each other, even though they're such different movies. Maybe it's that kind of like contained setting, you we're know, apartment together. versus motel. Yeah, we're putting together a pretty good list of apartment horror. Mm-hmm. Right. I know. But yeah, like um, one thing I think that definitely separates Critters 3 from other straight to video movies of the era is its credits. Mm. What it does with the credits here, Charles Band would never do. <laughs> you have so much confidence that you have a feature length film that you start running the credits while the movie is still going instead of throwing to black for 15 minutes of credits to make sure you have a feature length film. (laughs) It's such a refreshing change of pace here. Yeah. But it's also, so it's like so refreshing. It's so different. And also one of the worst credits of all time, just because this is a scene that gets interrupted like every five seconds right. as it just keeps going. Mm-hmm. And you're like, no, I don't need to, I don't need to pause as frequently right. as we're pausing here. Well, they almost feel yeah, like credit from a tells from the crypt episode or like an HBO movie. Mm-hmm. It feels like, yeah, it feels like Marvel before Marvel with like, except you add te- four different end scenes in, but this is one scene chopped into four, five, six, seven bits overall. Mm-hmm. And it sets up the fourth movie. It's all done in service of setting up the fourth movie, but you would be forgiven if like after the first pause, you stop playing the tape because mm-hmm. you would, Oh, it paused. It must be over now, but mm-hmm. they keep going back to that. Well, for some strange reason, yeah, like it's clearly like one whole scene that they mapped out, and you could have literally just jumped to credits when it says to be continued. Mm-hmm. But it just <laughs> keeps going. Like it doesn't want to just end the movie, but it doesn't want to be a post credit scene mm-hmm. either. It's, it's the original Return of the King. It's such a weird middle ground. Yeah. Because you keep what are freeze we... framing the same scene to just have credits listed over the camera. <laughs> we think of the um, ethical dilemma that is at the end of Critters 3 where you have the last two eggs that represent the last two potential crites and Uh, if they're destroyed uh, there are no more crites. On one hand you have mm -hmm. Sorry, I love this but I don't want to say why because it so carries into the next movie. The part four yes Mm -hmm. definitely that's a huge part of it. But what the things Ugg is saying here, the way Ugg is kind of, the more diplomatic way Ugg is being, it is so smart for just this one scene, sets up so much of the character he is in the fourth movie. Interesting. Well, even in the first film, you know? Yeah. Like, 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 I'm good. Like the first film, and I think this is, I really have thought about Ugg's arc too much in my time. But the first movie, he was a very destructive character, and it was that oversight that led to them having to go back to make Critters 2 possible because they did not take care of the entire infestation. They did not get all the eggs, and the bounty hunters had such a notorious reputation for being so destructive that now that then you have Critters 2, when you have uh, them coming back and you know being focused on eliminating this problem and Ugg kind of loses everything because of that kind of oversight because of those people that they were he loses his entire partner and he Mm -hmm. is i mean the second half of critters 2 Ugg is in a bad way yeah 
And like August is deep down. So now you have August started to work with, um, you know, the Galactic Council instead of like when you have the alien talking, telling them the job in the first movie and he just shuts them off. Right. You don't have that rebel attitude you have. And I think that is setting up, especially because it's the same writer and they were shot at the same time. That is setting up so much of what his arc ultimately turns out to be. Well, well, it's even a character in the that, first movie too. You have when they're on when they're in Grover's Bend for the first like half of the time that they're in there. There's really no regard for any of the city. Like, they're not there because of any sort of mission where they want to save the people of Grover's Bend or the people of Earth. They're there just to do a job, and anyone that gets in their way is going to get blasted as well. Right, and it's really not until I think they run into Brad. Mm-hmm. That they, you know, you start to see that kind of warm turn a bit for Ugg. So it is interesting to see that depiction at the beginning of part one to, hey, you know, there are only two of these creatures left. And sure, they're very dangerous, but it's really, um, it's it shouldn't be left in our hands whether or not the species deserves to live or die. Well, Which you also have that character that, uh, I mean, like Nat said, I mean, he's kind of lost everything, you know, mm-hmm. and he has lost everything because of his own decision. It's his yeah. own, it's his own kind of like outside the box, rebellious attitude that made him lose anything. So I could totally see where his character would begin to go that direction because he lost everything due to his own carelessness. So he yeah. has nothing left. So why not embrace the stuff that would have had him get, you know what I mean? Like he would have been successful. He would have, nobody would have died had he been played by the rules. So you Mm -hmm. see that character kind of slowly go that direction, which kind of was the opposite of what he originally was, but you could totally understand why he did it. It makes sense. And I don't think enough people really stop to think about that arc. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think Ugg's kind of direction toward becoming essentially a company man is really organic and is one of the most underrated things about this series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. And there is that cohesion. I think that at least for the first three chapters, I haven't seen part four yet. There is a cohesion that runs through it that I think does elevate this to, yes, it's a B movie. Um, These are all B movies, but there's more thought and more planning and like a little bit more heart that goes into him than something that's just kind of maybe slapped together. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I agree like, 100%. There's more thought to the continuity of these movies than anything from Halloween 5 through, you know, Halloween Resurrection or anything in Friday the 13th Part 7 onwards. So there's more thought into, yeah. you know, the continuity of, like, these little movies than some of the bigger franchises overall. Well, I think uh, David Chow, I think he does a great job writing family, mm. which maybe mm-hmm. he doesn't get enough credit for. I mean, even toxic ones. I mean, the family in Texas Chainsaw 3, you know, yeah. uh, top dollars, entire family and the crew. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like mm-hmm. a big network of bad guys, you know, and they're pretty yeah. protective of each other, you know. And I, yeah. I think that, like, maybe – when we think about him as a writer, you know, we focus on the splatterpunk aspects or like the more abrasive, the gore stuff, which I mean, mm-hmm. don't get me wrong. It's amazing, but he's really good at writing. I, I, I think relatable familial characters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, this, this movie is such a good example of that. Yeah, I'd agree. Mm-hmm. Yep. So what else do we have with critters three, my friends, what else do we be? Not gotten to talk about that we want to discuss. One moment, I have to have to point it out. Okay, mm-hmm. because we've praised this movie so much. There's a ridiculous bit where the, the you know because the critters ate through the brake lines. Essentially, the truck is barreling towards the apartment. Mm. It is basically it is literally like on fire. It is smoking, and you have that reaction of uh, Marsha be like, hmm. Something. (laughs) (laughs) She's so just like nonchalant and just like chill about it. It's so ridiculous. Also, I I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a huge sucker for artwork for movies. You know, it's, it's something that I just, I've, I, sometimes I love, you know, I 
obviously, you know, grew up in the full moon era. I'm sure mm-hmm. you guys can agree. The artwork is so striking for a lot of those movies. It is so simple, the box art for Critters 3, but it is seriously my favorite poster of the entire series. Mine too. Right? It's yeah. so good. It's just the city and a Kreitz just popping up with his hand up, like almost like waving, you know? It's it's brilliant. I love it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like he's like eating through the poster, too. He like, he like has that torn paper. And, and that tagline, like, you are what they eat. It's mm-hmm. so good. <laughs> you know, like Critters 4 definitely was a step back, I think, uh, as far as the poster art. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, I... I think that's what's so great about most of the series is that I think even from poster art perspective, you know, it, it, it kind of draws you in, mm-hmm. you know, uh, like, I mean, even the new one, really, I mean, going to like a target or something and seeing the cover of Critters Attack, you mm-hmm. know, if, if I wasn't familiar with the series, which I mean, you know, obviously I, I jumped at watching that. But even if I wasn't a fan of that series, seeing the, the cover art with all those Krites, like just the design of them, it's so easy to want to watch these movies because, I mean, the initial design that the, you know, Kios brothers did, like it was so good. And, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, it's something that like, you know, I think I said that in the first episode, you know, it's, it wasn't munchies. You know, munchies mm-hmm. just seemed silly, you know, and not even in like a playful or like fun way. It was just like. You know what I mean? It, it felt like such a silly thing. Yeah. Whereas Critters, Critters, there was kind of like a really relatable, down to earth approach to these movies, even if they were like fantastical in, you know, the beginning of the first film and most of the fourth film, you know, in outer space. There's mm-hmm. something that you could just relate to with these movies. There's something mm-hmm. striking, whether it's visual, the performances, uh, the music of the first two movies. Like, there's so much to love about this entire series. Yeah. Well, I think, I think with the first three Critters movies, I feel similar to how I feel about uh, Three from Hell, which I just watched for the first time this week, is that if I were at a bar and these movies were on with no sound, like they would hold my attention the whole time. And that's not an easy feat. Like, I don't say that very lightly. Mm-hmm. Um like the visually, they're a lot of fun to watch. The critters themselves are a lot of fun to watch. There's some fun in parts two and three in particular. There's some really good kind of slapstick bits and comic bits that mm-hmm. you can just kind of get drawn to visually. So I, I think that that kind of carries through it. I don't know about part four, but I would say for the first three movies, like that's a thing that runs through them is that if I just have them on in the background with no sound, I'm going to be drawn to these movies if I, you know, want to watch them again well yeah. it, it it goes for like you know i th- i said this so many times over the episodes you know like there's so many people that work hard to make a movie you know and i i think what's so great about the critters films uh you know this one specifically is that it i think it, it's successful at what it sets out to from every aspect and you know i i know i spent most of this episode talking about david Chow's writing but like he's really good at like coming up with these ideas that are fun to watch or mm-hmm. read. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, I I was I interviewed uh, Sandy King Carpenter, John Carpenter's wife, recently for Dread Central about this about their comic book line, and you know I got a lot of those comics to read. And there's one that David Chow wrote for the Tales for a Halloween Night series. I think it's Volume mm-hmm. Five. And it's basically about like kind of the universal horror nights where, you know, they're all the classic monsters and there's these thugs going in there to like, you know, create havoc. But then they have the real universal monsters basically tearing people up in real life and this thing. Mm -hmm. And there's something about his writing that it's just fun because you could tell it's like he's almost like putting his hands together, you know, like in this devilish grin as he writes it. And there's so many gags in Critters 3 that you could almost picture David just like doing that, you know, because it's just like you have to love the material to write a movie like Creators 3. You mm-hmm. know, yeah, I'm sure it's a job, but those jokes like the hanging upside down for the phone, <laughs> that's diabolically brilliant. You know, like I've always like my wife laughs at it. I've always said that I hate good jokes. Hate them. <laughs> if they have a good punchline, you know, I'm out. I don't want it. But that fucking phone gag. Dude, that is my humor 100%. And, like, if there's, you know, we could talk about the Krites. We could talk about, you know, Ugg almost turning, or not Ugg, but, uh, uh, 
Oh, I am drawing a blank. Uh, the uh, Lee almost turning into Freddy. Mm-hmm. But Critters, I think, is that hanging upside down, reaching for the phone. Like, like it's so fun to watch that, yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like, it's hard to watch these movies and not smile. Like, like Mike, like what you're saying, you could watch these movies on mute or in a bar with no sound. And mm-hmm. they're just as fun to watch because yeah, I mean, absolutely. everyone does such a great united job at giving horror fans such a fun ride. Mm-hmm. And I'm really grateful for the amount of, of critter action that we get in yeah. Critters 3 because mm-hmm. you're not getting it next time. No. <laughs> oh, I feel for you, Mike. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I think that's a good note. I think we're going to end on a high note then. Yes. Um, so what else do we have going on here right now? We have Critters 4 next week. Um yeah, ending the show is never one of my strong suits. So, uh, yeah, we have we have Critters Four coming next week, and uh, I don't think we're tackling the TV show. Uh, no, I, I think we'll do okay, Critters cool. Five, and then uh, yeah, Critters Four, the then Critters show. Attack. Uh, you know, and then we're probably going to do a one-off or something to move into Alien. But I mean, like Mike said at the beginning of this, uh, we are now part of the Morbidly Beautiful Podcast Network. We could not be more excited about that. They have such a good lineup, and they're such a good site to be a part of. And by the time this runs, it will already be announced. I have a new venture with Morbidly Beautiful, uh, I think being announced tomorrow. It's called Blood on a Digital Page. Uh, mm-hmm. They asked me to kind of spearhead this. Uh, they approached me about it. Basically, it's going to be a haven for anyone who writes short fiction that would like to get it featured somewhere. Mm. So basically, uh, they asked me to be in charge of it. People could send in whatever, you know, and we're trying to curate a really good place for short horror fiction. So if any of our readers want to do that, uh, I'm sure by the time this episode comes out, it'll, the news will already be around. So, I mean, we'll try to share it. But I definitely suggest you do that Uh you know, we had such a fun time already with these Critters episodes. I can't wait for the other two. So, I mean, that's kind of where I'm coming from with this. Yeah, yeah. it'll be – I think Alien runs – Alien Day is 426. We usually – I think looking at the calendar, our our scheduled show would be 427. So my guess is we would maybe just post it a day early just to hit Alien Day. Yeah. Um, which I think that's going to give us – there's going to be like a solid month between when Alien hits and when Critters ends. So, Jerry, you mentioned you wanted to do like a special one-off for episode 50. So mm-hmm. what were you thinking for that? I was thinking of doing either a uh, – I've never done live tweeting because I find it kind of weird. But mm-hmm. uh, either something like that or a commentary that all of us could watch and kind of like – you know what I mean? Like – Something fun like that. I'd like to do something outside the box. So, I mean, if if you have any ideas or, you know, anyone else has any ideas, I'd love to hear them. Because we're coming up on episode 50, which, to mm-hmm. be honest, when Mike, and, when Mike approached me about doing the show, you know, like we – you know, Mike said right from the beginning, you know, let's, let's just kind of have a conversation, talk about a movie, you know. Like let's see how, how it works out, you know, maybe if it's something we want to do. I never imagined that, like, we would have a show, let alone, like, people being so receptive and, like, really nice about it. Like, mm-hmm. we, and we've, we've gained so many awesome friends from it. I mean, Brian Kuyper, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, that guy, he we've also made some now. enemies. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, we've definitely made some enemies, unfortunately. But, you know what I mean? Like, I appreciate people listening to the show. Mm-hmm. We're coming up on episode 50, like I said. I'd like to do something special. So, if anyone has any idea, you know, yeah, feel, we can feel definitely – I think we can definitely talk about some ideas for episode 50 and then see what we're going to squeeze in between that and Alien. So, we, you know, we just haven't really decided yet where we're going to go. I think it just we've been crazy busy in our work lives overall, but we've still – very fortunately, we've been able to wrangle some really good guests – we may have like a really and Jerry, you need to reach out to this person because you can DM them and I can't. Um, you know, we might have a really cool guest for one of the next two Critters episodes if our schedules can work out overall. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> so I yeah. doubt it will happen. Um, just, the ideal. There, just the idea. Just the idea is fun. 
was really fun. But yeah, to your point, Jerry, like I did most podcasts don't make it past episode 10. Um, I think that's not, that's a pretty much well-known thing. Like usually, you know, you, there's so much content that's out there at this point. There are so many shows competing for your ear space. There are, I mean, like we, I thought this was a really unique idea. And then you see folks like um, our friends over at Halloweenies that started with the Halloween series and then the Elm street series. And then now they're going to be doing um, starting this March 13th um, every month, dropping a new Friday, the 13th episode. And they do such a tremendous, tremendous job and such a deep dive. Um, our friends from Halloweenies who are part of the consequence of sound network. Um, so uh, the fact that anyone listens to this show stuns me at this point. Um, you know, I'm really kind of like humbled by it. And the fact that we've gotten through almost 50 episodes at this point kind of blows me away that, you know, we're kind of plugging along here, but it feels like we're just getting started. Like to Jerry's point, I think we have a lot of ideas of things we would like to do to kind of promote and grow the show overall. Um, and I think par- joining Morbidly Beautiful is the first step in something really cool like that. Um, you know, I have an idea. You know, we want to have Nat. We want to have you on as often as possible, as often as you'll have us, okay. um, along with some other guests, and kind of kind of grow this thing organically and see where it can goes. And it's funny because we have not, except well, Scream and the Blair Witch Project. I'm like looking like we're a year in, and we've barely touched on series that I'm super passionate about, which I think is really, is one of the really fun things. Like we are just getting started here. So to all our listeners, thanks. Go ahead and follow us over at pod and pendulum over on Twitter. We also have a Facebook group. If you go Facebook and search pod and the pendulum, you'll find us. You can also find those links over on our show page at morbidly Um, so go ahead. I also and, think, uh, mm-hmm. I also think really quickly that, and I will say this, like, I don't mean to sound arrogant or anything. I mm-hmm. do think that we are the most approachable podcast around. Yeah, like, you are. I, I <laughs> <laughs> like, I love talking to people on like mm-hmm. Twitter or anything. If any read or any listeners have like just come to the show and stuff, feel free to like tweet mm-hmm. at us or message us or whatever. Like we appreciate listeners. Yeah, I love talking horror, and I try not to be. One thing I don't want, I I, I strongly believe in the phrase like "don't be the turd in the punch bowl." Um, so I mean, like you listeners, you know my opinion on movies like like Mandy, um, which you will never. What one thing you'll never see me do though is if someone is like talking in a space like either in real life or online about how much they love that movie. I'm not going to be that person that like jumps in and is like, "Well, that movie sucks." You're an idiot for thinking that. Um, no, we want to like celebrate movies and celebrate people's fandom and what they love overall. And we hope we're providing that, that space and opportunity for people. So to our listeners, thanks very much. Nat, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And next episode will be Critters 4 and that will be on, uh, March 16th. So three sixteen. So I think we got to throw in some bonus, like stone cold, Steve Austin, content for an episode dropping on 316 day definitely that or like get resurrected or something there we go have a great night everyone have a great week